Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope you're having a good weekend. Uh, this is going to be a discussion of Ross MacDonald's The Witcherly Woman, which is outstanding, a really, really good detective novel, uh, roughly from around 1960, and it, that puts it right in the middle of uh, Ross MacDonald's Lou Archer series. This is a Lou Archer novel, and Archer's this private detective, and the, the series spans roughly from 1950 to 1970, and we see the, the change in the character, the change in MacDonald's writing. It does improve over time. Uh, and I don't want to say it's a substantial improvement because the early books are good, but there's a shift in focus. And this book is firmly in sort of what I regard as like the middle period, the middle focus, which is where you not, don't just have a private detective novel, you know, where you're, there's a crime that needs to be solved or there's a missing person uh, who's possibly dead, you know, has possibly been, been murdered and that needs to be solved. Um, but it also is going to involve a lot of like family drama, family tension. The, the family history in the same and in sort of so the two strains of influence are the detective novels of like Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett that group uh, James Kane <coughs> and then sort of the, those writers who take elements of the Greek myths and Greek tragedies and then try to put them into a more modern setting so individuals as varied as I would say Eugene O'Neill or even certain aspects of like uh, Ibsen's uh, uh, plays like Ghosts um, and those sort of get fused and then pushed into this detective novel. And what comes out uh, is very even. It's not an uneven writing. It's a really interesting. It's a really interesting narrative. It's a really interesting detective story that is, of course, much more than just a like whodunit mystery. Uh, and part of that is that McDonald's a good writer. <laughs> so you you get the the book opens with coming over the pass. You can see the whole valley spread out below. On a clear morning, when it lies broad and colored under a white sky, with the mountains standing far back on either side, you can imagine it's the promised land. Maybe it is for a few, but for every air-conditioned ranch house with its swimming pool and private landing strip, there are dozens of tin-sided shacks and broken-down trailers where the lost tribes of the migrant workers live. And when you leave the irrigated areas, you find yourself in a gray desert where nobody lives at all. Only the oil de derricks grow there, an abstract forest casting no shade. The steady pumps at their bases nod their heads like clockwork animals. Meadow farms lay on the edge of this rich and ugly desert. From a distance, it was a typical Lost Valley city, thrown down helter-skelter at the foot of barren-looking mountains and garnished with a little alkali dust. Uh, <laughs> and so there, there's this sense of, like, he writes really, really, really well, uh, within the mystery genre and I think that's that's something that people are often shocked by is that somebody who's writing this like thriller narrative is also just a darn good writer and McDonald is absolutely in like he's taking from all of those great writing traditions and he's making something that works really well uh, another one um, Boulder Beach College stood on the edge of the resort town that gave it its name in a green belt between some housing tracks and the intractable sea it was one of those sudden institutions of learning that had been springing up all over California to handle the products of the wartime copulation explosion. Its buildings were stone and glass, so geometric and so spanking new that they hadn't begun to merge with the landscape. The palms and other plantings around them appeared artificial. They fluttered like ladies' fans in the fresh breeze from the sea. Even the young people sitting around on the grass or sauntering with their books from building to building didn't look indigenous to me. They looked like extras assembled on a set for a college musical with a peasant subplot. A very young man who resembled Robinson Crusoe directed us to the administration building. I left Homer Witcherly standing on the steps in front of it, goggling around with a lost expression on his face. I'd have laid the odds that he was a lost man in almost any environment. And so we have a writer who's a solid writer, and then he's giving us this mystery. Uh, and, and most of the uh, most of the Archer books are set in sort of a Santa Barbara-ish area. They go down to LA periodically, but more around like the 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 towns and suburbs that are springing up into larger cities uh, in California along the West Coast in that period. And then this one does take us all the way up to San Francisco and uh, Sacramento even, which is kind of an interesting. Like the Archer books don't always go up there, but it's a uh, it's very enjoyable and. For, for within the Archer novels, there's sort of one aspect is that he's always pressing. He continues to press on, you know, he, like Philip Marlowe, he gets hit over the head, he gets beaten, he gets shot at. Sometimes he gets hurt quite badly, and he keeps finding that way to carry on um, in, in sort of that Marlowe tradition. I do think, though, that he's a little bit smarter. He's not just a guy who has a code. <laughs> um, and I, I would say the key difference is World War II. So... Um, 
these books are set after World War II. They start they start being written after World War II, and uh, MacDonald creates the character of Archer as someone who served in World War II. And I think there's this difference around you know a, a person who who has that sense of duty, and it's not just like a personal code, but has that sense of duty. Now, how is that person operating as a private detective? So we're not we're not dealing with someone who's working during Prohibition or during sort of the 1930s and how harrowing that environment is. We're dealing with, with a character who is very much informed by that sort of like greatest generation aesthetic and and um, that determination. And so it, it just weighs differently. Uh, the characterizations exist. So even though there can be cynicism, even though there can be you know this jaded look at, at reality, as we saw in those paragraphs around cities that don't really belong in the desert. Uh, you know, uh, th this idea that there's an American dream for some, but not for all. And then, you know, McDonald's going to peer back and say, wait a second, even the places that look like a dream often have secrets at their center or secrets at their core, or something has happened either recently in the recent past, the past three months, the past three weeks, uh, the past three years, or a generation ago, uh, that has put all of this into motion. And it's never about, you know, what just happened, who committed this murder, but it's what led up to this. There, there's this level of psychology behind it. Why would someone do this? What, what brought this about? Not just who did it, but what brought this about? And that's, what, that's what's happening in so many of the Archer novels, particularly um, from the Galton case on. So from like the late 1950s uh, on through the 1970s, you get, we get into these, these books where it really is an unraveling of the narrative. And it's just, it's really, really enjoyable to read. It's well written. Uh, if you get sentences like, I caught three hours of sleep at $5 an hour, but the old movie projector I was using for a brain wouldn't shut down. <laughs> Which is just fabulous. Uh, there is, you know, there's some violence, but there's not a, there, there are, usually isn't a huge body count in the Ross McDonald books, which some people might, might pref actually prefer these if, if you've tried sort of Dashiell Hammond or Raymond Chandler and felt that they weren't quite your cup of tea. You, you might really prefer these. Um, this one was very enjoyable. As I said, I don't want to spoil it, uh, but it's one I do highly recommend. It, 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 we have a uh, college student who uh, disappears and, you know, obviously we're very concerned. She's been, and it turns out she's been missing for a while. And there, her parents had recently gotten divorced in the past year. And so let's find, you know, her father's here, but let's find her mother. She'd been last seen with her mother. And the mysteries just keep unraveling. There's this giant house that's for sale that no one has been living in. Uh, there's the person who's selling the house is found, you know, murdered. And so, like, the, it just continues this, this narrative, this mystery to unravel. Uh, but it, it's so much more than just a mystery. Uh, so I highly, highly, highly recommend Ras McDonald. Uh, two of his books that frequently pop up, as I mentioned, The Galton Case is sort of his first, what I regard, like, really, really great mystery. Um, the Chill is often also regarded very highly as a McDonald uh, novel. He does have books that don't have Lou Archer. My favorite of the ones I've read is The Ferguson Affair. I don't think it's, uh, you know, we, I talked about how there's a clear influence from Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep or something like Dashiell Hammett's, you know, Red Harvest. But what we don't see are the sort of like the gangs that exist in both of these. There aren't really violent gangs roving around committing habitual criminal actions. It's someone who committing a crime who's never done that before. Uh, no discussion of Ross McDonald can occur without talking about his wife, Margaret Millar. So Ross McDonald's real name was Kenneth Millar. Uh, Margaret Millar was his wife, and she wrote mysteries as well. She was actually a successful writer before he was, uh, and he didn't want to trade on her name. But I discussed uh, her book, um, Beast in View, which is astounding, uh, several months ago. So I'll link that video. And as I mentioned, there there is this real sense that the Greek tragedies are present and, and hovering over uh, the Archer stories in in a way that I think Eugene O'Neill captured some of that in, in plays like Morning Becomes Electra, which is so obviously indebted to Greek tragedy. But those themes are themes that O'Neill explores in his other plays as well. Uh, Ibsen's Ghosts, which I'll, I'll link as well, um, you know, is one where we see a, a family, there truly is a mystery in the play that involves something that happened in the family a long time ago. And, and its current ramifications, which are quite harrowing. Uh, and so if, if you've never read Ross McDonald, give him a shot. You might, you might find a mystery writer that you really, really like. So I will uh, leave with that and be back with Herodotus tomorrow.
Have a good one, everyone. Thanks.